So we started out, I think, last time talking about this 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 grid games language as an example of, of a modeling language that one might use in a model-driven engineering approach to building software. And so what I think I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about how that language was built, how, how, how I've built that language, how I've built the infrastructure behind it, and a couple of other things that one can do with it, now that one has it. Before we look at some of the code bits, etc., I thought I'd give a sort of really rough overview of what in the model driven engineering world we think of as a language because we think when we think of a language when you think of a modeling language and modeling approach we always think about three main things um, which are the abstract syntax the concrete syntax and the semantics the abstract syntax in many ways is what holds everything together Okay, so this is the set of concepts that we can actually talk about in our language and the relationships between those concepts. Okay? And then on top of that, we will build one or possibly multiple concrete syntaxes. And a concrete syntax is about how do I interact with the language? What does it look like? How do I write things down in the language? What do I do to edit models in my language? Um, it's how do I store them on disk, etc. That's all concrete syntax. How do I interact with those models? Uh, that's in there. And the import one important thing, and we'll see that a little bit in a, in a moment, is that there can be more than one for the same modeling language. So far, we've only talked about what the models look like. We've described data structures. Okay? We've described a structured way of writing things down. But we haven't said anything about what these things mean at all. And that's really, really important. A computer is dumb. It just looks at this and goes, this is data. It, un unless we tell it anything more about it, it won't know how to interpret that data, what to do with that data. And that's where this third thing comes in, which is the semantics, which we talk about as well, where you say, for this abstract syntax, here is what it means. If you use these concepts and you instantiate them to say something and write something up down, then here is how we're going to interpret this. And there's different ways in which we can give abstract uh, semantics to, to our languages. What we're going to see in, 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 in our grid games uh, language, what we've used there, is we've used an approach called cogeneration, which is very similar to compilers uh, in, in sort of typical programming languages, for example. So let's have a look a little bit at our grid games language and how we've built these various bits for that language. So here I've got, again, my grid games language with the, with the Minesweeper example on my computer. And you can see it's a textual language in the first instance, right? I'm writing down text in various structures. We've got these sort of keywords here that are sort of color coded already. And, and then we've got various, various words, etc., and, and symbols that we're using to writing down our, our specification. So that's an element of it. The concrete syntax already is that it's a textual language in the first instance that allows us to, to, to interact with our model through writing text, editing text, and, and looking at that text, okay? The way we define textual languages typically is through a grammar. And, and a grammar is essentially a set of rules that say, that, that give us, that give us patterns that we, can, that we can sort of instantiate in our text. Okay, and so what we've done here, for example, is we've written down uh, a grammar a grammar rule here at the very top that says for our grid game for any grid game model, we, it will always start with the word game. Then we will give the name of that game that we're specifying. Then we're going to have an opening curly brace. Eventually, we're going to have a closing curly brace at some point, and in between that, we'll have various other things that we can specify. We can specify these these states, cells, actions initializations, fields, and options. And each of these refers to another rule here. So for example, here, the states refers to this global cell state spec rule. And so if I go to that, it tells me what this definition of states in, in sort of the overall document looks like, okay? Um, and so that's something that starts with the keyword states. And so if I go back to our Minesweeper game definition, we'll find that here. So here is something that starts with the keyword states and then has uh, the name of these states and have some parameters and then has the actual states inside. And that's exactly an instantiation 
of this global cell states back rule here. Okay, so it starts with states, has a name, possibly has some parameters, uh, curly braces, and then a set of states and an indication of what the start state was. Now, the technology that I've used here specifically for building a language is something called Xtext. There are a number of other similar tools out there. Importantly, now there are also tools that allow you to build languages uh, where the editing and infrastructure, etc., exists in, on the web and runs in your web browser. Um, and they, are for, for textual languages, they're very similar to this, right? And what they do is you define this grammar, which kind of defines your concrete syntax, but indicates actually where the abstract syntax concepts are as well. And from this, you generate a lot of the code infrastructure. So you will see here on the left in my code browser, you'll see a lot of code in there. And most of that code actually is generated more or less directly from this grammar. One thing that's perhaps particularly interesting to look at is this class diagram here. So this diagram here, that's the abstract syntax of our language. And I've sort of started cleaning up the layout a little bit so that we can look at this a little bit, but I haven't done the whole thing. But let's maybe just look at some of the key bits here so we get a, a bit of a feeling for what abstract syntax looks like, okay? Abstract syntax for, for, for any language out there is fundamentally a set of concepts which are represented as class classes or as boxes in this diagram. They may have attributes, which is where we can put data in there that specifies the, the specific information we want to, to capture about this concept. And then there are relationships between those concepts. Um, and relationships are represented in our abstract syntax diagram here as edges between the boxes, okay? And so we'll see here that we've got this grid game concept which represents a game as a whole. It has some information about the name. And then it has this, these edges here to these various things that can be contained inside a grid game. So for example, we can have zero to star, which means an arbitrary number of cell specifications. And each cell specification again has a name and then contains various things uh, inside of it. Or we can have this global cell state spec thing that we saw earlier. So we can have, again, zero stars so any number of those. And these then contain cell states further down and so on and so forth. Okay, so this all gets generated from our grammar, but importantly, the other way around, if I look at my Minesweeper specification here, that actually gets passed into a set of objects that are instances of those classes and that have those connections between them that we've just seen in that class diagram. And that's what allows me to then do more with my model. Okay, I can use that set of objects to do this validation, for example, that we saw last time where we were able to see oh, okay, this particular state is never reached. Or I can use it to specify the semantics of my language, for example, by writing a code generator. So for example, here is a bit of code that generates the classes that implement individual cells. So what does that do? It has a grid game here, and it goes through all the cells, and for each cell, it generates a file where it puts in the code for that class. And if we go there, we see what it, what it does is actually it generates some text, which I've written in here, and you can see that with the gray backing. And in various places, it doesn't have just hard-coded text, but it puts in text that it copies out from the model, right? So it'll go into those, op into those interconnected objects and it'll navigate through the edges and between the various objects to find the information that it needs, right? So for example, here it goes, I'm gonna go into my cell, go into the members, I find all of those that are variable specifications, and for each one of them, I'm going to generate what essentially is a Java field declaration, and so on and so forth, right? So really, this becomes taking the information in that set of objects and turning it into text. And the tricky thing here, of course, then is always to work out what's the right code to generate, and how do I generate code that's ideally reasonably readable, but also isn't totally cumbersome and suboptimal and, and doesn't perform well, etc. Some of you have asked about why do I have to go to all of this effort, right? Why, why do I have to do all of this? Um, why can't I just write a library? Um, and the answer is you can. Okay, so a lot of what we've seen here, so if you look at this class diagram, for example, right, this looks a lot like just standard object-oriented programming, and you could do that directly in Kept. Okay, in fact, there is something that people have called uh, internal domain-specific languages, uh, 
that does exactly that. They write libraries that where the functions are written so that it reads like a language. Okay, so it's it's sort of halfway there, right? If we look at our grid game language here, we might end up then writing something like where we say new game uh, and we'd provide the parameter Minesweeper dot and then we'd start putting in all the additional information. So we might have a function field easy that then again lets us add with a dot lets us add additional information such as the width and so on. You can see, you know, we can write a library that allows us to do this and it reads like a, like, like a language. Um, and that sometimes is the right thing to do, right? Especially if the people who are using your language are people who are already programmers and who want to make use of all the extra features that the, the, the host programming language gives them, then this may be exactly the right thing to do. But if the users of your language aren't actually programmers, then this is perhaps not so helpful to them. Um, but also, doing this means you are still constrained to what your host programming language can do. And so, things like our check for, uh, for, for reachability, yes, you can implement this in here, but you can actually only run the check when you run your program. Whereas with the standalone language that we had, we could run the check statically and get feedback as we were editing the, spe the uh, specification rather than having to run it and then see, oh, I made a mistake. Okay. And again, it's horses for courses, right? In different contexts, you will want different things. The, these sort of more internal languages may be easier to build, may be quicker to build. They mean people who are already familiar with these tools don't have to learn new tools, and then that may be the right thing to do. In other contexts, very much it isn't the right thing to do. One thing that becomes really difficult if you have a library is this thing with supporting multiple concrete syntaxes that I sort of indicated here briefly. One thing we might want to do, for example, is we're talking about state machines here a lot, right? So a very natural way of looking at a state machine is actually visually. Because we have a separate language, it becomes really easy to specify a second concrete syntax for that language. And I've done this here. I've created a diagrammatic concrete syntax here with a tool uh, called Sirius that, that allows us to, to, to build these graphical syntaxes really easily and really declaratively. And what I've done is that this is a diagram of the state machine that's defined in this model over here already. And they're, they're linked together. Okay, so if, for example, I go in here and I add this additional transition, into my tech in, in my textual model, then you'll see that that appears over here in the diagrammatic model as well. And if I uh, again remove remove this here, uh, then it disappears there as well. Okay, and in fact, I can do the other way do it the other way around as well, where I edit things that the kind of added things in the diagrammatic side of things, and, and they get reflected over into the textual model. Okay, because actually they're both the same model. It's both the same abstract syntax representation, they're just being edited through different concrete syntaxes. Okay? And that's something that's essentially impossible to do when you have a library, but becomes possible when you have your own language. And that means you can then provide different stakeholders in, say, a larger software development project with different perspectives on your model that are captured in a notation that's familiar to them, that's usable to them, and that makes it easy for them to contribute their expertise to the overall project. People have asked about what's the, what's the cost of this? And when, when so and therefore, why would I do it, right? Um, first off, yes, it is being used in industry and is used uh, fairly widely. Um, in fact, quite a lot of people use it without being aware that they use it, right? If you've ever written a Kubernetes script, essentially you're doing this. If you've ever uh, used React, essentially you're doing this. But there are places where people do it sort of more explicitly. A lot of sort of the systems engineering world is moving increasingly towards what they call model-based systems engineering, which is a lot of this. It's a lot of building models, building these structured representations of large and complex systems and their all various moving parts in order to be able to stay in control of all of that complexity. So where you have large and complex problems, it becomes worthwhile the effort of building this additional infrastructure. 
Another area where it becomes worthwhile the effort is where you're going to build similar systems again and again, but there's some complexity to the differences between those different instantiations. Okay? And there, I think, comes into play what we sort of call the cost-benefit curve, I think, of MD, which you can sort of imagine like this. If you had a diagram here where sort of we have sort of time and an effort and we, we want to sort of sketch out how that develops over time, then if you have a regular project where you don't use uh, MDE, your effort would probably be, you know, something like this. It would sort of largely stay at one level, give or take, but obviously there's variations over time. If you have an MDE project, and in particular you have one where you have this situation where, where you'll build, be building similar systems, again and again over time, then your cost-benefit curve looks probably a bit more like this. And again, you know, I've drawn it as a clean line, but it, it'll wobble. So you'll have this bit at the beginning here, where you invest fairly heavily into building the languages and the code generators and valuators and da 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 da. But then over time, that effort and cost actually amortize, amortizes as you're building more of these systems, as you're benefiting more from the additional analysis capabilities that you're getting, um, and so on. And so over time, your effort will, pro will probably actually end up being lower than if you'd not done it. But, you know, you've got to be aware that there is this initial uh, cost uh, of, of building the infrastructure. The way you do this is you click on one of these cells and it then tells you whether there was a mine there or not. And if there wasn't a mine, then all is fine. And as in this example here, you might see a little number that tells you Let's how many Let's just write a very silly little Python program. So I can write this function. Let me make a little bit of uh, bigger font size for you. 